The Civil War Uncovered is brought to you by Mind Lab Americas. I'm Robin Smith, and welcome to another episode of The Civil War Uncovered. During the American Civil War, nearly 50% of the battles were fought in Virginia. The major rivers of the state were obstacles used as defensive features. Steep river banks were often impassable barriers to troop movements. The natural river fords were usually the only option for large-scale troop movements. Thus, the river fords became choke points where artillery could be concentrated to easily break up major moves by either army. And in the winter of 1863 to 1864, the Rapidan River was the front line between both armies. In this episode, we examine Confederate camps and artillery positions along high ground overlooking the Rapidan River. Let's join our team in the field. Good morning, my name is David Shackleton. I'm here with my good friend, Kevin Owen, and a friend of ours, Bob Painter, has brought us to this very special property here in Virginia. Um, we've got the Mine Lab GPXs out here with us this morning, and we're hoping to find some good North Carolina relics on a campsite that was used over the winter time. Um, I've been detecting since 2005 on and off. Kevin's been detecting since 2007 on and off. But we've we're lucky to have with us Bob, who's a, a very seasoned uh, mine lab user. So he'll be he'll be giving us a lot of lessons. Hi, I'm Bob Painter. Uh, I've been relic hunting since 1972, and this morning we're going to hunt a North Carolina camp that. Uh, is part of the Rapidan River defenses that the Confederates had stretching all the way from Germana Ford to past the town of Orange, a uh, distance of about 20 some miles. This particular camp is associated with an artillery unit and uh, that's evidenced by these uh, silvered North Carolina buttons. This will be my first real hunt on a on Civil War property, so looking forward to it. There are artillery pits uh, on the property uh, as well as the huts they live in, and uh, I found so far uh, eight silver North Carolina buttons. Wow. So we should have a real good time. Well, let's uh, let's head off. Okay, so, well, we're going to take the long, well, the the hardest route. It's hard to imagine, but 150 years ago, this area was cleared of vegetation and home to thousands of soldiers. Thought we had a snake at first, just a long earthworm. If you're walking in the woods and detecting, and you start seeing these little piles of rocks, and sometimes you'll only see two little rocks, and then you'll see two little rocks down the way a little bit, uh, you could be looking at a hut site. The other evidence that you get when you, you're in a hut site is you'll start finding square nails in patches. Even uh, even if there's no rocks for the chimney, wow. you'll you'll get these square nails that you can determine if there's a pattern. There'll be a patch here and then a patch over there. Pretty sure that would be a hut site or I bet camp. You in, in the winter time when the, when the leaves are off the trees, I mean, you can see the piles of rocks just looking well, down the slope. That's right. One thing about Confederate huts, they're not that uniform. They're, you know, the federal huts were regimented they had to put one here and one there and one there and they had to be so many feet apart and they had to have a road between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but in the Confederate camps, they're just everywhere. They, there's there's find a space, no pattern. Yeah, find there's a no spot, pattern. Them in. Well, it's obvious they were here at some time. Whether they came back or not, I guess is, is insignificant, but it's obvious they were here. No. They, they definitely left their mark on the property. So I guess uh, so. What you want to do is you want to head down here to the to the creek bed. Yeah, we're going down and across the creek, okay. and we can start detecting down there. And that'll be the beginning of the North Carolina camp. Sounds good. In the pawpaw jungle, uh, Kev, when you're hunting through here, just take uh -huh. take your time. Hunt real slow. Uh, you know, go around all these bushes. Uh -huh. 
I found buttons laying right behind little trees. The North Carolina camps up this holla and they traveled right down this creek bottom. Okay. So this is a travel area and most relic hunters don't think much about the travel paths between two camps. Mm -hmm. uh, I've found a lot of stuff just in the travel path between two camps and the travel path up to the latrines. That's why I'm kind of looking for the latrines uh, that I've never found so far. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks, good luck. You can hear a little bit of the power line interference. It goes woo 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 woo. That's the power line. This is only probably my third or fourth hunt with this mine lab, so still in the process of learning it. But so far it's worked out well. Before, the only kind of metal detecting I've really done is um, playgrounds, parks, and stuff, looking for you know lost chains, jewelry, that kind of stuff. This is my first actual Civil War hunt on a property. We have the bullet. Well, the hunt on the Civil War site is neat because you know you got all the history and all. Well, what I'd done before was playgrounds and beaches. You know, wide open, didn't have all the poison ivy and good itchy stuff you end up with three or four days afterwards. Which um, next time I go, I will have a long sleeve shirt on. <laughs> now that's what one sounds like. Well, we'll see what that is. That's a little bit louder than one of those bullets. These little balls, these little bullets come in round and conical. But it is. That's a 30 caliber uh, round pistol bullet, and it was under that root at about four and a half inches, and sounded like it was on top of the ground with this mine lab. Well, I guessed right. That was a bullet. Yeah. I'm learning this machine's talking to me. How about a tip to help you work better in the field with your metal detector? Hi, I'm Kevin Hoagland from Mine Lab Americas, and I'm here today with the folks from the Civil War Uncovered to bring you a few technical tips for better using your metal detector. Uh, if we're out uh, detecting together, how close can we get with these Mine Lab uh, pulse induction machines? You know, a lot of times it depends on the conditions around you. If you're in extremely heavy mineralized areas, sometimes you have to get a little bit further away from each other. The easiest thing to do is when you get out in the field, let one machine start up, go through the auto-tune, and then let's say you move off a little bit, turn your machine on and see how bad you hear the other machine. And just to make your adjustments from there. There might be times that you could be within 20, 25 feet of each other, and there are other times where you have to be a little bit further away. Big, you, you, um... Okay. Let's see. Point the way. <laughs> Should be right there. 
Wildlife. Wildlife. This doesn't sound that deep. Wouldn't that be something if we found one right off the bat? That'd be awesome. Whatever it is, it's right there. I'd hit right up in here. Oh. See how it sets off the machine? Uh, the frequency. Yeah. yeah. The, the, there we go. That is a... That's a rimmed. That's a pulled, pulled uh, Confederate two ring bullet. Yep. Yeah, that's a pulled gardener. Uh-huh. See the, uh, the wormhole on the top of it? Mm -hmm. Where they... When they come off the line and come back in camp, they would pull the bullets and empty their guns so uh, for safety's sake. Well, a Civil War soldier put that in his rifle with the intent of shooting it and never got the opportunity to shoot it. And uh, as Bob was saying, during the hunt, once they get back to the lines, they have to clear the rifles. They have to clear the guns so that they're safe. So they stick that rod down in there and twist into the top of the bullet and pull it out so that the gun is now safe. Like I said earlier, this ground is highly mineralized and uh, BLF machines just uh, have a fit trying to find something in here. But... Uh, these mine labs cut right through it like it's not there. Digging in the woods, huh? So Kevin had been working over on the side. Uh, him and Bob were separated by about 150 feet. And Kevin was over there and he had a good signal. And uh, I think it was driving Bob a little nuts because he could, Bob could hear that Kevin had a good signal. <laughs> and then Bob was probably thinking, oh, it's one of those buttons. I better get over there. <laughs> At this point, David and Bob couldn't resist coming over and giving Kev a hand. Probably uh, eight, 10 inches. Yeah, good 10 inches. And it's a... Uh, not close. Let me go get my machine so I can turn it on. And that's a rock. That makes it even more difficult because yep. that means you're right on a chimney site. But that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. And I'll be right back. Cool. There isn't any way that could be in that hollow root. Yeah. yeah. Could be. Out. Big old nail. Nothing in that pile. No, it's right there. back of a button. Let me see that. You know what? It's a silver button back. <laughs> yep. One way you can tell that this is a North Carolina button is the square slot. Yeah. They have a uh, shank that's made like a wedge that just goes down in there. There was, There's no face. I can tell you that now. Inside there is a blob of solder that holds that shank in place. So these things feel heavy. So that thing so, has been long since. Yeah, there would, be a, there would be a shiny 
area where the silver broke off it if the whole thing was there. Yeah, the Kevin from North Carolina was digging up the back of a North Carolina button. Once again, it was under a root. It was tucked underneath the side uh, of the hole where he was working, uh, probably four or six inches down, but it was enough of a signal where the mine lab was, uh, was really picking up a strong signal, giving off a good tone. Uh, most relic hunters have not dug a silver North Carolina button. Uh, and they would, be, they would be tickled to death to just dig the back off of one like uh, Kevin did. <laughs> one thing we should note here, this episode was filmed on two adjacent properties. We had permission to dig on the campsite property, but we only had permission to film on the Cannon Pit property. Now back to Bob as he takes us on a tour. After a long walk way up the hill from the North Carolina camp, we're at the Cannon emplacements uh, that the North Carolina troops had. The, these cannon emplacements overlook the Rapidan River and uh, a ford that's uh, in the distance. You won't be able to see it, but uh, the, the cannons protected that ford. And of course, they also protected against uh, federal attack. So we'll walk over and take a look at them. They're right behind me here. You can see they're kind of a square shape with an exit back where you're standing. And this cannon would have been pointed right toward Culpeper County and the, and the Ford, uh, the main Ford for this area. Over in here, there's a trench line that, that runs down through the woods. It's the second, well, I guess it would be the primary trench line. Uh, the one back that, that we crossed earlier would be the secondary trench line. And we can walk over here. In between each cannon emplacement is a trench. Hard to see in all this flora. There's not too many places in Virginia that you can find pristine uh, cannon emplacements that have been, they've remained untouched since uh, 1863. You can get right up on the mound and shoot down in it. It's kind of interesting to note the elevation here. The cannon sits down in there and the barrel just sticks over the, the ridge here and they've got a clear, field of view. Uh, back then there were no trees. All the way to the Rapidan River. There you go. They don't look like much, but they're real. <laughs> Let's catch up with David and see if he's having any luck. So this is another, another pit right here. Uh, Bob said these are all campsites. Where this North Carolina unit was camped. That sounds good. This signal here actually sounded pretty good. It didn't null out at all, which would have indicated some iron. It is right on that root or right by that root. Maybe we can uh, get some dirt out from around it. So I was digging a china. I was in this hole. I was about a foot deep, and uh, Bob, you know, Bob came over and said, "Listen to the machine. It's it's probably not any deeper. Let's check the sidewall. Let's check the side of the hole more. Listen to the machine." Uh, I'm glad he came over because I would have kept digging. <laughs> I would have kept going to China. <laughs> Running through the jungle. Ouch. Hey. <laughs> Looks like a bullet. Oh man. You know what that is? That is a scabbard tip to a sword. Uh, or maybe a bayonet. Bayonet, bayonet. bayonet yep. scabbard. It's a bayonet uh, scabbard tip. Way cool. The Civil War Uncovered crew member and longtime reenactor Rob Davis explains the importance of bayonet scabbards during the war and in reenactments today. The bayonet and the bayonet scabbard are two very important items. And on the scabbard itself, which is made out of leather, is a metallic brass tip called the finial. And the brass tip is to help protect the user and the carrier from this very sharp bayonet tip. 
And so quite often what would happen when you were putting the bayonet back in the scabbard, you could push the end of it off if you're doing it very forcefully, or just over time it could wear loose and fall apart. And then this uh, finial tip, the brass tip, would be lost. That would leave the tip of the bayonet itself exposed and while this is attached to your belt and you're running uh, both in a reenactment or in the real Civil War, you could actually hurt yourself, cut yourself, stab yourself, or do the same to the person next to you. So today in reenactments, as we're being inspected as reenactors, if this tip to the scabbard is missing, they won't let you carry the bayonet onto the field. They'll make you remove it as a safety precaution. And as we're relic hunting today, we often find these tips from original bayonet scabbards because they're only held on by tacks and they can very easily fall off. But they were a very functional item and very necessary for safety. There is something else in there, I think, because it's the- It's snapped. Run your machine over see if it's still in there. We go at it like this. Mm -hmm. There it is. See it right there? Yes, sir. That's exactly what it was. It's the scabbard, scabbard tip finial. Scabbard tip finial off that. Pull this dirt off it so you can see the way it's shaped. I always call them little pawns off like a chessboard. And it's uh, snapped off. They call them scabbard drags. That's very nice. Hold yeah, that. Good that find. Very cool. Yeah. You got the find of the day. Uh, this is a little relic hunter's tip. Whenever you go into a camp that's been heavily hunted, go real slow for one thing and the other is hunt around every tree just kind of go around the base of each tree because uh, many relic hunters are just uh, they're not lazy but they just don't take the time to go around and pick up stuff that might be just under the roots i've dug some of my best buttons right up against a tree it was a great day we had fun out in the woods it was my first time really relic hunting with uh, gpx 5000 found lots of um, interesting stuff can't wait to go to the next place and try it again. So we got out for a couple hours this morning on a property uh, that's, been, that's been detected quite frequently for the last 30 years. Uh, we, we got a couple of Mine Lab GPX 5000s out here. Um, about three hours on the property. We did pretty well. Um, got, got a couple of bullets, pistol bullets, a, a, a scabbard tip off a bayonet, which is actually a really neat find. And uh, my buddy Kevin, who's from North Carolina, actually found the back to a North Carolina button, which is really cool. The, uh, this is one of the first things that, he, that he's ever dug up, Civil War relic-wise, so he's really proud of that. Um, one of the things that I wasn't expecting was the, the terrain on the side of these hills. Um, when, when you're swinging a metal detector, you, you know, you're so focused on listening to, to the sounds the detectors make, and you're not really aware of how steep the hill is that you're going down or how steep the hill is that you're going up until you start breaking out in a sweat. Uh, so, so that was one of the things that I was not expecting on this trip. Um, overall, I thought we did exceptionally well for the three hours that we were out here. Um, everybody, everybody was finding targets from two inches deep to over a foot deep. Uh, looks like the smallest target we found is probably uh, some of these older square nails, um, tack nails maybe. And um, and Kevin found this really nice uh, 30 caliber pistol bullet too. So these are small targets that were relatively deep. So I was I was impressed with what we found uh, and the depths we found them at. The machines work great. Uh, we had three of them within probably 75 feet of each other for most of the morning. Um, had a little bit of interference with some overhead power lines, but beside that, they they uh, they ran great. This morning we hunted uh, North Carolina. Uh, Confederate camp in Orange County, Virginia. Uh, the soil here is highly mineralized and the uh, GPX 4800 and GPX 5000 uh, didn't notice the mineralization at all. Uh, cut right through the ground and of course we found some uh, nice Confederate relics. Uh, I pulled a two ring gardener, uh, two 31 caliber bullets, a uh, finial from a uh, scabbard tip uh, and uh, a couple other little lead items. That's all for this episode of The Civil War Uncovered. Look for new episodes monthly. For more information, visit thecivilwaruncovered.com.